Down here in the fat cave, just noticed I'm about to clock over 9,000 Ks in the Hyundai Kona Electric. And that's despite the pandemic and, of course, wearing pajamas 24-7 these days. The new normal. <laughs> yes. So here we are with the 12 things that I have learned about using an electric vehicle as my primary means of transportation. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously. Or you can just click the card that's somewhere up there now, I think, if I remember. Number one with a bullet about using an EV, okay, on a regular basis. I have learned not to worry, like at all, about range or recharging. And this is especially true if you have off-street parking. Like, I know last year was kind of unique in the context of personal mobility, but still, historically, it's been rare for me to need to drive more than 430 to 450 Ks in a single day. And that's what the Kona Electric delivers when it's fully charged. The onboard range estimation algorithm is dead accurate in that car too, so I know you can trust it. I got this single phase 32 amp charger installed. It's just out there on the brick wall outside the fat cave and it's weatherproof and it will reliably recharge the Kona at its maximum 7.7 .7 kilowatt AC recharging rating in about eight or nine hours. So even in the unlikely event that I come home with the battery nearly flat, you just sleep on it and you are fully charged again in the morning using the cheapest overnight off-peak electricity. So that's kind of convenient. A three-phase charger, like if I had three-phase power installed to the premises, which I don't, it would not actually be an asset in this situation. And even without a solar array on the roof, this is a dirt cheap vehicle to run, okay? At, let's ballpark it here, like 26 cents per kilowatt hour, a full charge is gonna cost you about 17 bucks. So it's about $3.70 for 100 Ks of mobility in the EV, versus ballpark 12 bucks or something for the same thing using internal combustion. So provided you've got off-street parking and you live in a city, operating this EV is just super convenient, like mainly super convenient. And occasionally, yeah, you might be on the road and you might need to track down a fast charger, but that's not that hard either. It's just one more thing generally for me to remember to recharge occasionally, right? Like we live our lives this way now, don't we? You know, phone, laptop, tablet, camera, car, check. I know some of you will have looked up the performance data and if you have, you'll be saying like, 7.6 seconds, naught to 100, that's mediocre at best. And I'd agree with you, like, yeah, it is. It's middle of the road to 100 k's an hour. But I don't do that in traffic all that often, mainly because I don't want to immolate my license in our hyper-regulated traffic environment. Mainly, I do like zero to 40, zero to 50 in traffic, and you probably do too, because that's pretty common. We do the red light shuffle, don't we? You stop at a red light, and then it goes green, you get going, you do zero to 40, zero to 50, and then you gotta stop again because next red light, congestion. And in that context, I'd suggest that the Kona Electric is a frigging weapon. And to use one of my favorite things, which would be a good fart analogy, the Kona Electric is silent but deadly from zero to 50. Like internal combustion is pretty compromised getting off the mark. That's just not something internal combustion does especially well. Like just look at the engineering countermeasures that are in place to overcome this compromise. Certainly the power delivery characteristics of the internal combustion engine and powertrain are compromised on fundamentals and the driver needs to use considerable finesse to avoid the two venial drag racing sins of bogging down or 
over cranking it and spinning the wheels, right? That takes skill, getting it just Goldilocks. In comparison, the Kona just hooks up and goes, partly because electric motors make their peak torque at stall speed, like at zero RPM, so they're already poised for peak performance when you are just stopped at the lights, and partly because there's a single speed transmission with no slip, such as from a clutch or a torque converter. And you've got to bear in mind that speed relates to energy in a kind of spooky way, like energy is proportional to the square of speed. So 0 to 50 involves the acquisition of a quarter of the energy that it takes to get from 0 to 100. So 0 to 50 is about reaction time and finesse, whereas 50 to 100 is much more about the application of outright grunt. Okay, so 50 to 100 is three times more work than 0 to 50. I hope that makes sense. It's just basic physics. One packet of energy to get you from 0 to 50, three more packets to go from 50 to 100. That's how this rolls. Internal combustion excels at 50 to 100. The Kona EV is really good from 0 to 50. This means that the Kona EV is not about to win too many outright 400 meter drag races, but it is going to carve up a great many notionally faster cars at the lights, if you're into that kind of thing. And they're often really not expecting that. There is no sidestepping this issue. Eco tyres are rubbish from a driver's point of view, from an owner's point of view, from your and my point of view. Car makers fit eco tyres to EVs because range is such a big deal. It's a huge selling point. And the low rolling resistance characteristics of eco tyres add a small amount of range in official tests. And every amount of range matters in the brochure. It's like less than 5%, probably substantially less than 5 insofar as I can measure it, you know. Eco tyres are therefore great for the marketing department, but they're crap to drive on, especially in the wet. When I got the standard Eco tyres changed over for a set of high-performance Michelin Pilot Sport 4s, everything changed about the dynamics of that vehicle. The Kona just became a heap more composed generally. Like, it's less likely to lift the inside wheel and spin it if you nudge it a bit hard just after the apex, and it just hangs on better, especially in the wet, and it's more predictable at the boundary between grip and slip, even though the threshold there is substantially higher. So on a stack of friggin' Superman comics, I'm an atheist, so to me this is exactly the same as swearing it on a stack of Bibles, I can swear, that I didn't think I'd enjoy driving an EV quite this much. This is, of course, after changing the tyres. I do not miss refuelling at all. Like, no sane person would. I will never be nostalgic about that. Not even the absence of the unbeatable two-for-one Kit Kat diabetes meal deal from my life could make me get all teary about not refueling at the Bowser ever again. However, it is a self-deluded fantasy of epic proportions to think that owning an EV means that you have divorced hydrocarbons. That's just you spending the big bucks to weaponize your own confirmation bias. If you own an EV, you are just as dependent on hydrocarbons as some guy in a big, fat diesel 4x4. If you took hydrocarbons from your life, there would be no house to live in, no food in your non-existent refrigerator, no clothes to wear, no pharmaceuticals, no steel to build the frigging car from, and no roads to drive it upon, among other things. They're called facts, dude, and you don't have to like them. Of course, most EV evangelists are too stupid and or cognitively dissonant about how the world actually works to acknowledge their ongoing dependency upon hydrocarbons. <music> this is 
This is such a virtuous concept, right? Saving the friggin' planet in my EV. <laughs> but I'm absolutely certain that driving an EV does not help save the planet, which is a euphemism, of course, for reducing the probability that the human race will destroy itself and become extinct by virtue of making the Earth uninhabitable, which is pretty much the trajectory we are on. Now, if you are a climate emergency denying nutbag, you need to have a good hard look at yourself in the mirror, in my view. Because denying the existence of climate change and denying the fact that humanity is causing it is absurd. It's scientifically absurd, dude. It's up there with QAnon and anti-vaxxers and fluoride conspiracy and moon landing denial, etc. You know, we could do this all day. There's so many of these things, but I'm already so looking forward to the comments on this. Please don't disappoint me, will you? Anyway, car makers also need to look hard at themselves in the mirror. I'd suggest because they're industriously leveraging climate virtue just to sell. EVs. In reality, they just want you to buy one of their cars. EV, internal combustion, they don't actually care. Just buy something, right? The life cycle CO2 emissions break even point for EVs versus internal combustion depends heavily upon the electricity grid composition where you live, obviously. If you've got a coal fired grid, it's bad. But even in a place like Germany, it's north of 100,000 kilometres, and that's just to break even. If the battery doesn't wear out, like, you're not saving the planet, dude. Sorry to upset that apple cart. Actually, I'm not. Humanity cannot consume its way out of the climate crisis by buying EVs or anything else. The concept of doing that is absurd. <laughs> An actual virtue wrapped up in the operation of EVs is reduced toxic pollution in our major population centres. This is huge. I'm not talking about CO2 with this one. I'm talking about things like unburned hydrocarbons, carcinogenic particles and oxides of nitrogen, which are ultimately respiratory irritants. EVs do not admit that crap. And this is unequivocally good because that crap kills more people prematurely than car crashes do. So you can feel unreservedly virtuous about this aspect of non-emissions in your EV without pulverising the epistemology of reality. Yes. All these governments making proclamations about EVs, right? They're not saying anything about getting the most toxic vehicles off the road, I note. And these would be old trucks, many of which in Australia are allowed to operate without any pollution control whatsoever in our big cities. And not addressing this is absurd. Instead, inner city councils are denying applications for things like child care centres, for example, on major arterial roads, which to me is kind of like prescribing paracetamol for a brain tumour. While EVs are certainly a net plus for human health in advanced cities, in predominantly Western democracies, I'm pretty sure there are minus for human health in some other significant contexts. If you're one of those brain-dead EV evangelists who never paid attention to how the world actually functions, do me one favour, OK? Google the term child labour cobalt mining and review the page one search results from reputable news sources like the Financial Times and reputable organisations such as Amnesty International. Cobalt is of course a major and somewhat non-negotiable component of lithium-ion batteries. So it's not just EVs contributing to this particular phenomenon, it's portable electronic devices generally. The Financial Times has a particularly grim report from July the 6th of 2019 called Congo 
child labour and your electric car, which should be mandatory reading for EV evangelists everywhere and the population generally. I note all these governments making all these bold proclamations about banning new internal combustion vehicle sales over the next 10 to 15 years. It's actually 14 countries insofar as I can tell, meaning 179 countries are not doing this. However, it is making something of a splash in the news and it's seen as wholly virtuous. And every car maker with EV aspirations is down on its knees in front of them, metaphorically, lips parted, waiting to proceed in the time-honoured tradition. <laughs> but I don't see too many statements from these governments or those car makers about sourcing the friggin' cobalt ethically. As in, in some way that prevents some of the most reprehensible child exploitation imaginable. So I guess whether EVs are actually a plus for human health or not is an each-way bet, and largely an accident of birth as things stand, deplorably. And that could be fixed, or at least largely addressed, right now, certainly by tomorrow. Back on the plus side of the ledger, Australia is massively vulnerable to a delicate supply chain of liquid fuels which starts in some of the most geopolitically unstable regions on Earth. And not to be melodramatic, right, but if that tap gets turned off one day, we're fucked. Like, properly fucked. Granted, this is somewhat less likely. Without the orange goblin at the helm of the world's most powerful military apparatus, but it's still a very fragile supply chain. And frankly, that fragility is not all about military action. Just imagine for a moment what would have happened had COVID been 100 times worse, which easily it could have been. We are, however, self-sufficient in coal, right? And we can therefore make endless electricity even if we were beset upon all sides by global pandemics and geopolitical unrest. So a significant vehicle fleet of electric vehicles might be a real asset in the domain of national security. And not too many people think of it like that. Note that a liquid fuels crisis would mean not only just no more fuel at the local filling station, okay? It's far more serious than that because it would also mean no abilities to supply food to the population, and no ability to defend the nation, no ability to enforce law and order in society, no advanced medical care. Apart from that, though, all good, dude. Dystopian apocalypse, basically, minus only the traditional infestations of zombies and or Vampires. So sorry to be the bearer of reality-based bad tidings once again, but in the real world, it's nearly impossible to make lithium-ion batteries any better. Like, Lithium is already the best metal available for batteries, mainly because it's really, really light and really, really keen to give up its electrons, both of which are exactly what you want in a battery. And happily enough, lithium is fairly prolific. Hypothetically, I suppose you could pair lithium up with a far better non-metal than we use currently, like fluorine, for example. That might work. Certainly it would work from an electrical point of view. This would almost certainly make for a better battery result. But it would also almost certainly become a bomb very quickly of sorts. Pro tip, okay? Lithium fluorine was actually trialled as a rocket fuel in the 50s or 60s, I think. And it was pretty good for that too, but ultimately abandoned because it was far too dangerous. Chemistry is absolutely hilarious like this. Two elements can seem so damn ideal for the one thing, such as battery chemistry, were it not for one or two pesky feedback effects such as, I don't know, blowing up. So at the moment, we've got the best batteries they can make with the most electrically reactive elements that 
mostly don't blow up, or at least don't blow up very often. And it's taken about three decades of diligent scientific research to get to this point. This is hardly a new field for research, in other words, so the gains are going to be incremental at best. A pro tip for you if you do most of your scientific research watching Marvel movies. There are no new elements to find, dude. Vibranium is not actually a thing. Tony Stark's not a real person. In the real world, research doesn't work like it does in an Avengers movie. Everything there is to know about batteries essentially is already known. There's no better battery technology imminently awaiting deployment. There are some nice ideas maybe, like graphene, which is essentially just little sheets of carbon one atom thick, but they're just not ready to be deployed, and frankly, they may never be ready. Basically, all lithium-ion batteries in service today use lithium and oxygen to do the fundamental work, plus heavy metals like cobalt, nickel, and or manganese. Maybe they use iron phosphate or nickel cobalt aluminium oxide, or even a spot of titanium, if you don't mind throwing away the checkbook and just paying through the neck for it. All of these different cocktails of elements add a shitload of weight to batteries, frankly, and they're there to do a six-way balancing act between energy density, power density, performance, longevity, cost, and safety. And if you pump up one of these features, at least one of the others is going to take a hit, maybe more. As an example, I'd suggest Tesla prioritizes some of these considerations, like the ones which the evangelists love, such as performance and charging time and things of that nature. They also catch fire rather a lot, and I doubt these two issues are unrelated. Pro tip on this, batteries contain electrolytes, which contain rather a lot of oxygen. It's elemental oxygen, okay, not the gas that you breathe. This oxygen is bound up in compounds like phosphates and metal oxides and things of that nature, okay? But when the battery gets too hot, these compounds easily destabilize and, entertainingly, they decompose partly into oxygen gas. So when that happens, you've got an environment with a lot of heat and oxygen gas, and it's all taking place in a confined, sealed space which, when you think about it, is the ideal recipe for a fire right there. And you cannot fight this fire the way you would fight a gasoline fire by just depriving it of oxygen, because this fire supplies its own oxygen gas. Yes. This is why safety needs to be such a friggin' high priority with battery design. Considering all of this stuff, I hope you're thinking words to the effect of, well, golly gee, Jim Bob, there are more technicalities in play with EVs than I had previously considered. So before you go out and buy yourself an electric car, my strong recommendation is to do the same basic triage that you should do before you buy any conventional internal combustion car. Only doing this is going to be far more important in this case. And the main thing to consider is choose a car maker with a reputation for solid customer support because you do not want to be in a battle with a car maker, which was, say, quite happy to sell you the car, but most unprepared to support you now that you have a problem with it. Nissan's fiasco's with the leaf, right? Numerous Tesla owners, former evangelists who've just been hung out to dry by electric hazels, spectacularly unsupported, the internet is full of accounts like that, then you've got the Gag Orders Are Us Corporation, also known as Mercedes-Benz, and of course the undisputed heavyweight champs of putting profit ahead of human health, Volkswagen. All in the EV game to some extent and vying for market share over the next several years. And here's you, thinking about jumping into this brave new tech. Like, dude, do you really want to be playing Russian roulette, metaphorically, with an undisclosed number of loaded chambers with a car maker who is far more closer to Idi Amin than he is to Nelson Mandela on the continuum of human compassion, right? 
This is the main reason why I'm prepared to run this particular MAD EV experiment using a Hyundai. EV evangelists love to declare internal combustion dead, not unlike the cockroach which woke up without its head one morning, but is as yet undecided about what that actually means. They often liken this phenomenon to what happened to horses when cars first arrived on the transportation scene, like EVs are going to do to internal combustion what cars did to transportation by horse, okay? But I'd suggest it's just not the same thing. Cars were objectively better than horses at everything. EVs are not better than internal combustion in this way. They are in some ways, but mainly they're just different. Many people drive long distances regularly. This is peculiar to Australia. We do that a lot. They visit the wilderness. They tow heavy shit. You know, there's a lot of that going on. EVs cannot meet the needs of these people, and it's inconceivable that they will in the near future. And then there's the budget, dude. Like, the Kona Electric, which I like, it does cost 50% more than its dizygotic internal combustion twin. And this is just a fact. And this price difference is unlikely to shrink all that much in the absence of something like immense government subsidies, which I would suggest in Australia. Do not hold your breath for that. A lot of people want to be virtuous, and I get that. They want to do the right thing, whatever that actually means. As a concept in isolation, many people are on board with that. But when you say, uh, just one small thing, dude, that's going to cost you like 25 grand more doing that, okay? Many people will see this as an insurmountable hurdle between where they are and where they want to be out there doing the right thing. Like, you've got to be kidding, dude. EVs will not kill internal combustion. They can't. <laughs> Finally, and perhaps most inconveniently, we live today in a world where everything seemingly gets reduced to a soundbite and polarised as if it's a battle to the death. Like, if Trump was good, Biden is bad, and vice versa. Just go out there and do the Vox Pops, right? That's how people are. They're polarised. In reality, these two dudes are probably just different flavours of self-interested, incompetent, asshole politician. They're on different sides of the same genre generally. But out there today in Searchville, it's all binary. Blondes versus brunettes, you know. Pro-life versus pro-choice. Religion versus atheism. The left versus the right. Open the borders. Close the borders. It's, it's a binary morass of fractured epistemology where the default interpretation of the other side's position is the worst conceivable interpretation possible. And thus... Rational debate on any issue, including EVs, is effectively stifled. Take masks. Masks are a great example. They're either a symbol of repression or virtue, depending on which particular nutbag you happen to ask. And in reality, I'd suggest a mask is just a barrier designed to trap aerosolized particles that might be infected with a virus. So there's that. The world actually contains more nuance than these polarised extremes would suggest. There is, in fact, a middle ground where reasonable people with differing views can identify common elements about which they agree as a point from which to proceed. There's also such a thing as objective reality. That actually exists. Ontological objectivity. Mount Everest, I'm pretty sure, exists. Subject to us not all being, you know, simulations being run on the matrix. I suggest, therefore, that EVs will not kill internal combustion. And in any case, that is not why they're here. It's not their purpose. This is not a war, and there does not have to be a winner and a loser. There will just be much more choice in the future mobility energy mix. 
And I'd suggest that's a really good thing. Hydrogen fuel cells are going to be the same thing, right? It's a great idea. And quite interesting, I think, that Electric Jesus is very keen to polarise opinion there by denigrating fuel cells. Obviously, in the Church of EJ, the enemy of my enemy is also my enemy. There is certainly a place for all of these energy delivery mechanisms in the transport ecosystem of the future, right? The future is pretty bright for EVs, that's pretty clear. They are going to be an increasing part of the transport mix. That is a dead set certainty, and I'm looking forward to that. But this is not a battle to the death between the forces of EV goodness and the forces of internal combustion and oil industry evil. That's not how this works. The future is just going to offer more choice for you and me. I can see the garage of the future and the not too distant future where there's an each way bet, right? An internal combustion SUV or something for towing and long distance driving and an EV for doing all the local hack work. And I really look forward to that.